We begin with Confucius, the granddaddy of all the ancient Chinese philosophers. And before we get into his ideas, I want to place him in his proper historical and social context. So he's flourishing in the 6th and 5th century BC. What's going on in Chinese history during this time period? Well, you've got your earliest Chinese state that comes on to the historical record through the oracle bones around 1250 BC. That's the Shang Dynasty. But really, many of the fundamental institutions, bureaucratic institutions, um, uh, some of the ideas about uh, son of heaven and what makes a legitimate ruler legitimate, um, that comes from the Zhou Dynasty. The Zhou Dynasty is flourishing from around 1000 to 750 BC or so. That's when the Zhou dynasty has its greatest amount of power. And it's going to be seen later on as sort of the golden age in Chinese history. Anytime you're looking for solutions to problems in the world you live in throughout later Chinese dynasties, the Zhou dynasty has the greatest prestige as a supposed golden age. Now Confucius is living in an era in which the, the Zhou dynasty still technically exists, but it's lost all of its real substantive power. Okay, um, and what we're seeing with Confucius and all the later uh, Chinese philosophers is that I like to think of them as downwardly mobile aristocratic elites who can trace their ancestry to some illustrious ancestors, okay? They can trace their ancestry usually to people who used to have wealth and power, perhaps during the Zhou dynasty. Maybe these are slightly fictitious lineages and whatnot, but nevertheless, uh, they, what, what, what it means is they have pretensions to uh, uh, be a member of the elite classes, and they have access to education. However, they no longer are the sort of people who have sort of uh, landed estates and passive income that's constantly coming into them. What this means is, is that they want to be a member of the elite, they have some of the trappings of the members of the elite, like an education, which is very rare back then, um, but they don't really have the wealth that you need to really be a member of that class. So they have to work for a living. They have to work for a living. Now, in working for a living, they come from a social class that historians identify as the shi. The shi is a Chinese word that sometimes can be translated as a knight, uh, if you're thinking of it in a military context. Um, but we're going to see it by this point. People who identify as shi are no longer really an aristocratic knight. Um, they are more people who are, need to parlay their education into a civilian advisory role. And that's what all the philosophers are going to be trying to do. Confucius is no exception. He's trying to find a government post. He wants to get the ear of various kings who have sprung up in the wake of the Zhou dynasty. The Zhou dynasty is crumbling, um, and now there's lots of smaller states that emulate the Zhou dynasty, uh, have many of the same ideas about what constitutes a civilized uh, a group of people, but they are separate states now, and they're competing with each other to sort of say that they are the sole legitimate successor to the Zhou dynasty. So you You've got many different states now, um, and all of them are looking for someone who can help them convince the world that I'm the most virtuous ruler, I am the one who has the true interest of the beleaguered Joe King at heart, and I will restore civilization and virtuousness and righteousness to the world. And these advisors are going to be going around trying to convince them, I have the secrets to make you a successful, widely admired ruler. Not just someone who wins on the battlefield, but who also is seen as a virtuous, just ruler. How do I have that, that knowledge? Because I have an education. I have a monopoly of knowledge over the texts that come from the Golden Age, from the Zhou Dynasty. Very difficult to read, uh, oftentimes passed down orally. That's what all of these philosophers are doing is that they are debating these big ideas about what makes a civilized uh, group of people, what makes a just political ruler, uh, and hoping that they'll be able to get their king, who they have his ears at court, they want to get him to be the preeminent successor to the Zhou dynasty. Okay, um, so what sort of magical secret knowledge do they have from the Golden Age, the Zhou Dynasty, that they say, basically, we're going to sell these secrets of good governance to a king 
who is desperate to have a more positive public image uh, uh, and not just be seen as a bloodthirsty tyrant. Well, men like Confucius say, I understand the golden age as handed down through the text, through the songs, through their ancient rituals. I understand these things. And through our discussions back and forth, I will impart that knowledge to you. That knowledge for Confucius was imparted with a text known as the Lunyu, the Analects. Many people uh, think they know what Confucius is talking about in the Analects, uh, but they haven't actually read the Analects. If you actually read the Analects, my favorite analogy for it is it's very cryptic. I like to think of it uh, sort of like the equivalent of a lot of little fortune cookie statements pasted one after the other. They all sound very profound, often quite vague, and kind of cryptic. Um, you think there's something pretty profound packed in there, but you have to unpack it. It's really open to interpretation. It's not a narrative text. It's not a cohesive narrative text in which you have someone saying, this is what I believe. These are the arguments and evidence that I'm going to lay out to convince you of my position. No, that's not what you're getting with the Analects. You're getting basically, you know, the master one day received a friend from far. Um, he, he, he responded thus, oh, isn't it wonderful to have friends who visit from afar? That's the passage, you know, two sentences, very cryptic. And then you're going to have generations, thousands of years of commentators looking at that and going, oh, I understand what he means. He's talking about blah, 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 uh, human relationships, and this is what he means. Um, and all these things get unpacked and dissected and interpreted. And so oftentimes I like to say when people think they're talking about Confucianism, they really think they're talking about, you know, what Confucius said. Um, really, they're not. What they're really thinking about is what later philosophers said about what Confucius said. Their unpacking of it. Because all later philosophers will be narrative philosophers. They make narrative arguments that have a cohesive literary value to them, as we'll see. They make clear arguments and they support it with evidence. Confucius does not do that. All right, His disciples listened to what he said orally, put it down in very piecemeal fashion. Okay? Now... All we can really talk about with Confucius are what sort of ideas did he touch upon? Because he doesn't have a grand vision for the world like later philosophers will. He makes a lot of pithy observations about little things that happen in his life. Uh, so what we're going to talk about with the remainder of this session is the ideas he touches upon, understanding with the knowledge that it's really later philosophers who are going to flesh all this stuff out not Confucius. Confucius by himself would not have had the legacy that he ultimately ended up having if later philosophers, particularly Mencius, uh, did not rework and flesh out and put meat on the bones of the Analects. So, Confucius is talking uh, primarily about what makes people civilized, and we're going to see the beginnings of a lot of talk about the elements of civilized behavior. And what we will find throughout all the philosophers who will pick up where he takes off is they almost all agree that civilization is culturally defined, not racially defined. Okay, That it is a set of practices that are learned as you grow up. Later philosophers will go into much greater detail on this, but essentially what we want to understand is that from the very beginning, it's clear, even with Confucius, that civilization is a way of, of behavior. It's a mode of behavior. It's a set of practices. And as such, anyone can adopt this set of practices. This will lay the groundwork for uh, uh, many, many dynasties that will be uh, originated in the northern uh, nomadic steppe. Mongols, Manchus, Tabgach, who will say essentially, hey, the definition of civilization according to the Chinese canonical texts is a set of practices that anyone can adopt. It's not based on your birth, uh, your, your, your you know, skin color, or anything like that. All right Now, what all the philosophers debate, however, and disagree on is what are the specific elements of civilization? It's a term that uh, usually gets summed up with the term huaxia. Huaxia is usually what's going to be the term that the philosophers will talk about when they're talking about civilization. Uh, what are the, the ingredients of huaxia? Um, and sometimes they'll agree on the ingredients, the elements of it, but then debate precisely what that element means. Uh, so what sort of things does Confucius talk about uh, that seem to be related to civilized behavior? Virtue, filial piety, ritual, benevolence. Let's tackle each one of these. Okay, what about virtue? Virtue is sort of, you know, in the, le in, in the political lexicon of Chinese history, virtue is everything. All right, de in Chinese, written transcribed today in pinyin as de, de, kind of an unfortunate pronunciation in English, I must say. Um, what is virtue? Well, it's vague. All right, all the ancient Chinese philosophers will say 
that a, a just great king must be a virtuous king. Uh, but few of them agree on just what exactly virtue consists of. Oftentimes, pretty much, a king is successful. This is how it works in actual practice. A king is successful in defeating his enemies, and he basically just says... As the last one standing, I must be virtuous. This must be heaven uh, essentially uh, uh, approving of my behavior and heaven granted me the right to have this victory. Therefore, I am virtuous. Well, that's okay for a military commander to do, um, but it's not something that the philosophers were going to sign on board to. They wanted to have more greater substance behind what a virtuous ruler actually does. One of my favorite quotes is when the Qing dynasty in 1644 replaced the Ming dynasty and, 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 and took over the Forbidden City in Beijing. Uh, the regent for the first emperor of the Manchu Qing dynasty said, quote, famous line, The empire is not the possession of a single individual. Whomsoever possesses virtue rules it. We possess it, and so we now rule. Okay, uh, a wonderful illustration of sort of, it's kind of like might is right. We won on the battlefield. The empire doesn't belong to any group based on birth. Whoever has virtue has it. We, as Manchus, not even really culturally Chinese, we also have virtue. We've adapted the practices of virtuous behavior. Um, I know that's not a very satisfying explanation because it's very vague. Uh, it's intentionally vague because it needs to be a flexible concept to accommodate so many different rulers throughout Chinese history. All right, Confucius, very famous for filial piety. Filial piety, everyone thinks of Confucius, oh, you know, Confucian ideology, filial piety, filial piety. All right, what is filial piety really about? Yes, he talks about it. He's talking about human relationships. What are the proper way that human beings should relate to each other in a society where we come together and live in dense settlements? How do we relate to one another? Filial piety uh, uh, is, the, is the, the term, the phrase, the ideology that Confucius will discuss. Uh, later philosophers will all take it much further and what exactly this means, but we already sort of get an idea, an inkling of what filial piety is, even in Confucius's time. It is the building blocks of a hierarchical sort of pyramid society. All right, in which each family unit is governed, uh, relations among the family members are governed according to filial piety. So, uh, uh, you know, everyone knows how they interact with everyone else, just based on your order, your gender. Um, you know, uh, girls defer to boys, sons defer to fathers, wife defers to husband, and so on and so forth. But, it, you know, if every single family, if everyone in that family knows their place, then, uh, uh, you know, that'll be a harmonious family. There won't be conflict if everyone knows their place, their duties. There's no uncertainty and thus no tension. Um, and then if, the, if, you, if your neighbors also govern their family according to filial piety, that's going to be harmonious too. Each of these small family units at the village level uh, is governed according to filial piety and is harmonious. So the village as a whole is uh, harmonious. And then all the way up until you get to the emperor. Who is the emperor supposed to be filial to? He, only heaven is above him. So heaven, he is, that's why he's called the son of heaven. That's who he directs his filial piety to. Well, he also directs it towards his mother, the empress dowager. But nevertheless, um, you know, so it's sort of a, the, this pyramid scheme for society. Um, and so uh, being a filial son or daughter, at whatever level of society you are, is a political act to Confucius, one of these little, you know, cryptic, pithy quotes from the Analect says, you know, someone comes in and says, why, Confucius, are you not in government? <laughs> and he's not, of course, he's not going to answer with, you know, sort of the true line, which is, I can't get a job. No one will hire me. And that's true. Uh, no, he comes back with a devastating response to, uh, you know, that has full, full, filled with moral righteousness as being a filial son and filial brother is taking part in government. Right? Filial piety is political. It's the basic ordering, the building blocks of society itself. And it's also quite useful to the state. This is why the state is going to find filial piety a very wonderful ideology to adopt officially in later dynasties. One thing Confucius says at one point is also, quote, a person who is filial and respectful of others rarely defies superiors. Well, good. You're going to have a pliant, docile population, right? Was it like that in reality? No. But the ideology it was very attractive to people in power to be able to adopt filial piety as sort of the official ideology. This is how we're going to work. Okay. Um, now, other things that you do, uh, sort of how do you make filial piety uh, happen on a daily basis? Well, ritual. Li. Ritual. All the philosophers are going to talk about ritual. You got to know about ritual. Ritual is, or, or the rites. Um, are guidelines for how all humans should interact with one another. In every conceivable situation, all right, ritual eliminates uncertainty and social awkwardness or perceived insults and slights. 
All right, it's supposed to minimize social tensions, the awkwardness of social interactions at every level of society because everyone knows their place. So ritual is sort of the actual prescription, the details of how you interact with other people. From greetings, how you greet your third cousin twice removed on your mother's side. That's different from how you greet your second cousin once removed on your father's side. You're, you know, every single human relationship is gonna be governed by different types of greetings, how you interact with them, how you talk to them, all the rituals of life, uh, weddings, funerals, there are certain ways they're supposed to be done. And you gotta do them right. And if you do them right, the world will be at harmony. Everyone knows their place, everything's being taken care of according to its proper time, place, and all people involved have their social station in life confirmed. All right. Ritual is so important that later on in later dynasties, you will have uh, uh, one of the government ministries, the government ministry that is in charge of education, so administering the civil service examination, is literally called the Board of Rights, the Board of Rituals, uh, the Board of Rights, because education is the study of ritual. All right. And conveniently, for the Confucians, and we'll see this with our next philosopher, Molze, conveniently, proper ritual performance for your major events of your life, not just daily interactions, but sort of like, you know, how you do a funeral, a coming-of-age manhood ceremony for a boy, uh, weddings, this sort of stuff. Conveniently, they require a paid ritual specialist, someone who knows all the arcane intricacies of how it's supposed to be done uh, for a successful union, a successful passing into the next life. Well, go get a Confucian ritual specialist and pay them. Confucius also talks a lot about benevolence, uh, a Chinese character known as Ren. Uh, benevolence is Confucius trying to cover his butt, sort of, and say, you know, it's not just ritual can't be rote. You can't just go through the motions. It has to be sincere. It has to be sincere. All right? There has to be feeling, humanity, Ren, behind your ritual. We are compassionate beings, not barbarians. That's the difference between us and barbarians. We not only adopt proper rituals, gleaned from the ancient text of the Golden Age from the Zhou Dynasty, um, we then know how to put those into practice with feeling, with sincerity. Right? And if you do all this stuff, you can call yourself a gentleman. This is another really famous term that Confucius talks about at length, and all the philosophers were, if you are virtuous, if you practice ritual, if you do all the elements of what a virtuous person should do, you can refer to yourself as a gentleman. Right, someone who leads by example. And everyone naturally follows their lead because they're cultivated, they're civilized, they've mastered ritual, um, and all of this sort of stuff. One of the famous lines from Confucius' Analects is a, a, a little you know, brief story about how Confucius visited uh, another state, um, and immediately, like wind flowing over the barley, his benevolence extended to everyone because they recognized we are in the presence of a true, transcendent gentleman who doesn't even really have to act Non-action, Wu Wei, a, a, another very famous concept that we see introduced here as well. Uh, the someone who is so virtuous and well cultivated in the ancient rites and knows how to manage human relationships and all that sort of stuff um, doesn't even really have to do anything. By example, he just sort of emanates the proper way of action for the world to be at peace and in harmony. Now, as I said, don't take any of these concepts and ideas and sort of, you know, swear by them. Oh, this is exactly what Confucius meant because Confucius's text, the Analects, is very cryptic, very disjointed, not a narrative text supported by argument. But our next philosopher, Moltze, will be very, very different. And his will be uh, a very cohesive, forcefully argued uh, uh, text uh, in which he directly tries to attack Confucius and propose an alternative for filial piety.